Well, how is everybody today? Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm so excited to be with you guys this morning and just take um, a moment, if I can, to, to brag on you guys. It is um, like just an awesome thing. I kind of lack the vocabulary to describe it uh, because I didn't, I didn't grow up in church, but I have seen environments and uh, even been in them where you kind of skyrocket into this uh, super spiritual place and, and, and everything is kind of like... Um, out here in dream world, and that's awesome, and we come in to, to church on Sunday, and we kind of ride this really spiritual high. How many of you know super, super spiritual people that talk about Jesus all the time, but you don't see a lot of his characteristics in their everyday life? How many of those people? Okay, so, so you come to environments where it's like super spiritual, people falling out on the floor, and that's awesome, and, and I love to be in the presence of God too, but what I love about um, this house, Epic Church, is a calling on our life to experience that place, um, and it happens predominantly in, in worship, whatever that kind of means for you. That typically means the, work, the music part of service, but what's cool is to actually be a part of a, a faith community, a church where you experience that, but then you come to a place where you discover what it means to really live out the principles of the Bible and be Jesus to people. Like, you don't just come and worship Jesus in in thought, but you actually worship him Monday through Friday by how you live your life and what you do. And here's what I mean by that. Here's what I'm kind of going to brag on you guys, um, at least a couple of instances. We had E-Team Party this, this past weekend. How many of you at the E-Team Party, Point Mallard? Yes, thank you guys so much for coming. Just a little bit away as a church, we say thank you for helping us make this entire God-sized vision happen by pouring yourselves, your time, talent, and treasures into this. And what the cool thing is, is there were a group of people who actually handed out bottled water before coming to the E-Team Party. They capitalized on the opportunity to go downtown and hand out bottled water and, if I say, be Jesus be Jesus to people, and then I'm not going to um, call the gentleman's name, but there was an instance also this um, past weekend where a guy was driving down the road and saw a person unloading a moving truck. Have you ever been by somebody's home or their apartment, saw them unloading a moving truck and just said, bless you? <laughs> Have you ever been that guy? You did a drive-by press. So this guy, is, he's driving by, sees the person, and God speaks to his soul, go help him. Have you ever had God speak to you, and you're like, hold up. You want me to just stop at a stranger and help them move their furniture? And so he kind of had the dialogue that we do. Well, the cool thing is, is he, he listened to the voice of God, stepped into that opportunity, and just helped this dude unload his truck and, like, built a powerful relationship because this guy's unchurched. So I want you guys to celebrate you for being the church, not just having church, because that is an unusual quality that you guys possess. So give yourselves a round of applause for who you are in Jesus and what you do, because it really is a big deal. So that being said, we're in a series entitled Overload. I must say Overload. And we all understand what it means to be overloaded in life. Like, I, I have all this stuff to do, but I don't feel like I have enough time to do it. How many of you feel like you run out of time in the course of a day? Like, there's just not enough time in the day. I have, I have also all these things that um, is on my list to accomplish, but at about 3 o'clock, I get the 3 o'clock feeling. How many of you ever had the 3 o'clock feeling or the 4 o'clock feeling or the 5 o'clock feeling? Like, it's just you, you run out of energy, and you don't feel like you have enough energy to, to get the list done. And then how many of you just know there's things you want to experience in this life? Like it's just some stuff you want to taste and see if that's good and stick your toe in that. But you're not really far, how, sure how far you can go without getting in trouble. Right? Can I, can I really do that and nobody's going to judge me? Or how far can I go? And so um, in this series entitled Overload, we're going to speak to that reality that the thing that's missing in our lives that's needed desperately is something called margin. And we know what that is. I mean, not sh like you're thinking, oh, that's what I put in cake. That's butter. It's mar no, no, not margarine, margin. It's this space that we need in our lives. Like margin is the place where we actually have time to read the book on stress. Have you just, like you're stressful, but you don't have time to read the book on stress, so you stay stressed. Or margin is where we experience calmness, not anxiety. Um, margin is the place where you can actually filter through what you're going to say. It just doesn't override your filter and you say things you didn't mean to say. Um, margin is where you're not late to work. How many of you need that one, right? If I just stop right there, like, okay, margin is you're not late to church. Like, there'll be some people in a minute and we'll totally call them out. So if you're in the hallway and you come in here, I'm going to be like, late. Okay, so 
How many, how many of that, like you try to get here at 11? Y'all, look at me. It's the 11 o'clock service. You all plan to be here at 9? We'll be able to start at 11. to be awesome. I'm just kidding. Like, not really. But like we, we all have this tension. In our, why is it? Because we lack margin. And so we're going to talk about margin in our day. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna claim back some time that's actually available to us, but it seems to, to leave us. Um, we're going to claim back some energy. Who needs more energy? It, like physical energy, mental energy. Some of you not raising your hand because you lack the energy to even raise your hand. And here you're like. <laughs> it's just, just how we feel, right? And then we're going to talk about uh, week three, um, margin in our morality. Like here's what everybody that kind of starts coming to church wants to know. How far can I get to the line and not fall off? Like how naked can we be and not be married? Why are you clapping? You married. <laughs> like, we had this discussion before you got married. Like, sit, how, many of you, how many of you in here was like, he just did not say that? No, here's why I said that. Because it's true. Like, how, how, how much can we kiss and it be okay? How, like, can I look at Victoria's Secret and be okay? Because I don't know if I need to go that far. Listen, I know, like, that's getting totally uncomfortable in here. And y'all are all like, it's getting hot in here, Pastor. <laughs> We don't need to be talking about that. No, no, no. It's actually the conversations you need to be having in church by the direction of God's word to do this, experience life to the fullest. Because here's you, there's something out of life that you want, and there's something that God wants for you in life. So this entire series is going to be based out of this scripture. It's probably, it's probably, truly, I have like a top ten and this is definitely in the top five, Ephesians 5, 15. I love the way God's word explains how to do life. Like he takes out the don't ask if it's right or wrong. Because here's what I've discovered about scripture. Like it'll tell you that. Who you know that in scripture there it says do this? How many know that's easy? If the Bible says do this, you go, oh, okay, I'll do that. And then sometimes you'll find it says don't do this. How many of you have the thou shalt nots memorized? Okay, so like, don't do that. But let me just be honest with you. That's easy. But what about the areas of life that it's silent on? And there's some super spiritual people going, the Bible's not silent on anything. Really? Show me the whole chapter on dating. It's not in Opinions 5.1. Because it's not in there. You know, so there's things in there. And so this scripture right here... God inspired to be placed into his word because he's really smart. And he wanted his people called by his name to live in this sweet spot. So he says this, be very careful how you live. How many tell your kids that? Be careful. Listen, I got the t-shirt. Be careful. Okay, be careful how you live. I love this phrase. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be a fool. But understand what the Lord's will is. Now, here's what's cool. If you're here and you're just starting out this journey, following Jesus, coming to church, you dig it here because we say all the time, and the people that invited you, you can come here, you can be atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, somewhere you don't know where, I'm not really sure how I fall on this, and you can come here, and here's what you're trying to discover. What is, you wouldn't, you wouldn't phrase it this way, but you're kind of trying to figure out what does God want? What does it look like? What does God want for my life? People who've been walking with God for a while, they say this, I'm just, I just want to know what God's will is for my life. What's God's will for my life? What, what does God want me to experience? What is God's will in my life? And right here, he says, if you'll live as wise, you're going to know what that is. And I'm going to set you guys free. I'm just going to tell you what God's will is for your life. It's one word, freedom. But we don't believe that. We think the world's will for our life is much better than God's will for my life because God's old, and the book's old. He's really old, and he doesn't understand my issues. Can I tell you what hasn't changed in 4,000 years? Humanity's issues. And this one hasn't changed that much either. Oh, this one's gotten a little bit worse because we're going to talk about time today. 
We already discovered we don't have enough time. There's not enough time in the day. Actually, there's plenty of time. It's 24 hours. It's just how we manage it and what we do with it. So God's word is extremely relevant, especially in this particular scripture, because he's saying stop asking the wrong questions. Start asking the right ones. What is the wise thing for me to do? And so we're going to look at this reality called time. But first, we have to be willing to own up to the fact that progress has robbed us of the thing it's promised us. Progress is supposed to create more free time. I mean, how many of you have a microwave? How many of you have a microwave? Okay, you're supposed to be able to cook dinner in 30 seconds. So if you can do, listen, you can go buy a hungry man meal, put it in the microwave for two minutes and 15 seconds and be completely done, but yet we can't sit down to dinner with each other. How many of you know in your family you don't have a whole lot of time to have supper together, say grace and sit down and have a converse like it's just scatterbrained all day long. You can have mac and cheese in 15 seconds. But we can't sit down and have dinner. Like, how many of you know, um, how many of you have the ability to start your car with your smartphone? Is that, that is, you, if you don't, you can. You can start, it can be cold outside. And you can start my car. Like, it's just, it'll start your car. It'll heat it up for you. But we still can't get to work on time. We go running out of there, pants on fire, try to get in there, drive down. It takes 30 minutes to get to work. And how much time do you give yourself to get to work? 30 minutes. And you go to 565. How many of you know you're not going anywhere in 30 minutes on 565? How many of y'all super spiritual people spoke in tongues over 565 and tried to get God to part the Red Sea of 565 to you? Like, it's just, Lord, help me. I left 30 minutes. And so I'm just going to deal with this wise challenge and we're going to speak some wisdom out to how to reclaim time um, that's been robbed for us. So I want to begin with Psalms 90, James 4, and Psalms 39, where the Bible speaks directly to being aware of time. Psalms 90, 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of, here's the word, wisdom. He's not even asking us to get smart. He's asking us to be wise. James 4, 13, What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes. Psalms 39, 4 through 5. Oh, Lord, make me know the end of what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. And then there's a small word right after this section of Scripture that says Selah. We blow past that word when actually the word means for us not to blow past it. What it means is, to, hey, hang out right there for a second. Pause. Put, put your life on pause. Put your reading on pause. Hang out right here and let the word of God speak to you before you ever move on. And it's, after, when it comes after something, it's because God has said something profound that he wants you to pay attention to. It says, let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths. With that, everybody hold your hand up, palm in your face, and look at it. Because if you've ever wanted to know, how long is my life going to be? It's a few of those lined up together. Aren't you so glad you came to church today? I don't care how young or how old you are. Like, if you're old, you have less of these. If you're young, you have a few more, but in light of eternity, in light of who God is, the writer of Psalms would say, oh, we just got a few of these. What's he saying? He said, I want you to understand how valuable a commodity time really is. And here's what's great, and here's what's awful about time. Time gives, and time takes away. Time is the only thing in the universe that exists and can simultaneously give you an opportunity and a gift and rob you from that same opportunity, that same gift. When you got up this morning, you were given an opportunity, a gift. It was called a minute. It was called an hour, possibly a day. And every time you breathe and every time you exist, it takes every one of those away. And it, the Bible says, in light of that reality and the fact that you don't have a whole lot of those, I need you to make the most of every time, gift, second, minute, day, week, month, year that you are given and don't treat them as common. 
because they're very, very valuable. So with that being said, we're just going to take a journey and we're going to talk about how to reclaim what the world seems to steal from us, which is time. You have 24 hours in a day. How are you spending it? Are you completely overloaded? Do you not have time to finish your list? Do you not have time to sit down with your kids? Do you not have time to go on a daddy-daughter date? Do you not have time to take your son out and teach him things? Do you not have time to have a date with your wife? Do you not have time to get the things done that you desperately want to get done? If that's you, then listen to wisdom, because the Bible says live as wise, not as unwise. And if you've driven on 565, what is the thing that keeps us from being on time at work? It's, it's not even the unexpected anymore. You should just go to 565, expect it to be bumper to bumper. But more times than not, this is the first way to reclaim time. Expect the unexpected. If you have it planned for it, guess what? It's going to happen. Let me, give you, let me just give you a truth. Whatever you decide to do, if you, how many of you have ever done a project at your home? You decide, I'm going to fix this, do this. It will always cost two times as much and take two times as long. Every, it's, that's without fail. That's not even the unexpected. That's the expected. What happens? You hit things that you did not expect. So my wife asked if I would build her a, what's it called? Pergola. Pergola is the Greek word for hell. Okay, I feel... I'm building a pergola. I feel like I'm in purgatory. I'm in prison. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's happening. You're Catholic. I'm not trying to offend you. It's just a weird place that we don't know how to get there, how to get out of. It doesn't exist. But I mean, anyway, so that's where I'm at with my pergola. Well, so I sat down, and the Bible, I'm trying to be wise. So the Bible says, before you build your temple, count your cost. And it's a temple, guys. It's really big. And it costs a lot of money. Okay, so, so I sat down, and we do the list of things, that lumber, um, some brackets, and some stuff. And we light all that list, and I go, shoot. $280. So it would cost to build a pergola. $280. We go to Lowe's. I'm now $750 something dollars into hell. That's where I'm at. Okay. And I, I will, I, also, I did not only underestimate the cost of building this thing, I underestimated the time it would take. I'll actually be leaving service today and pergola it because <laughs> it's just not done. Okay, so, so you got to expect. I just, there was a lot of things I just, I, I just didn't see coming. I didn't see $750-something on a pergola. I, I, that thing's going to live with me the rest of its life. That's an that's, that's expensive piece of wood. Like, it better do some cool stuff. But you know what it's going to do? Nothing. It's going to sit in front of my house and be... Awesome. Okay, so like you just have to expect the unexpected. And if you'll do that, you will give yourself, I say margin. You will give yourself margin that when that stuff comes into your life, you're not stressed. You're not full of anxiety. Like I'm cool with it now, but like day one of pergola in it, I was a little bit out of shape because I saw my savings account go farther down than I wanted it to. I saw my week being erased before my very eyes as I sweat profusely. I didn't even urinate yesterday. I sweat so much. <laughs> this is such amazing. So expect the unexpected. <laughs> it's a little view into my life. So I'm not even going to ask anybody to help me with it. You go, you go live in heaven. I'm going back to hell. All right. So, so number two, le- I should have practiced. Learn to say no. <laughs> Babe, can you build a pergola? No. Okay, but listen, here's what, I, here's what I mean by that. Ask yourself this question in your life. What, is, what are the things that only I can do? What are the things only I can do? Everything else, learn to say no to. I'm going to say no. Because here's what we stretch ourselves too thin, and people will use against you, you following Christ, to manipulate you to say yes. That is the truth. Friends, family, people that you're supposed to trust will say, well, you know, you're down there at that church following Jesus. You should. Have you heard that yet? Listen. Say no to that. Because there are only, you are married, you're the only one that can spend time with your wife as a husband. 
You have kids. You're the only one that can be a daddy. You're the only one that can be a mama. You're like, there are things that only you can do. Everything else you need to super, super analyze and be willing to say no to, especially if it starts robbing time from those people. Because here's what people don't understand. Your yes is very expensive. In business world, they say, make your yes be expensive. Here's what I say. In reality world, your yes is expensive. You know why? Because when you say yes to something, you're saying no to somebody you love. If you say yes to something outside of your home and outside of your marriage and outside of your kids and outside of your job, then you are like, you're saying no to those. And that's really, really expensive. Learn to say no. Because it will build into your life the thing that you want the most, and that is time. So expect the unexpected. Learn to say no. Number three, turn off the TV. Now, I looked on the Internet, and because it's on the Internet, this is true. <laughs> it was done by um, a group of scientists that are pretty reputable. So it says, average weekly usage for age groups watching television. Average weekly television viewing of age groups. How many 18 to 24-year-olds in here? 18 to 24, raise your hand. No, I'm not going to dig you. Actually, y'all are doing the best. 18 to 24-year-olds watch 22 hours and 27 minutes on average TV during a week. 25 to 34-year-olds, raise your hand. Raise them, be happy. You watch 27 hours and 36 minutes. 35 to 49-year-olds, where are you guys at? Y'all are rock stars. Look at this. 33 hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> 50 to 64-year-olds, where are you at? It's, it's 11. Y'all, most of y'all are in a nine, but go ahead, raise your hand anyway. 50 to 64, 50. You know why y'all come to nine so you can watch TV all day? <laughs> watch. 50 to 64. <laughs> 43 hours and 56 minutes. What are y'all doing? I'm retired. You need to retire from watching TV. Holy cow. 43 hours. Please volunteer at church. We've got plenty for you to do. We'll turn the TV on in the hallway so you feel like you're home. Okay, so <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> I'm totally not saying that watching entertainment is wrong. What I'm saying is make, make sure that it doesn't have you locked in and stealing from you the thing that you want, and that is time. Most of us say, I don't have enough time to spend with my kids. Cut the TV off. Well, I only watch an hour a night. Okay, well, but you're still complaining about not spending time with your kids. Cut the TV off. Do an, spend that hour with your kids. Um, I, my wife and I don't have time to talk. Well, cut the TV off because if you're watching TV, you're not really having a conversation. You're dialed in. How many of you have Netflix? Netflix will suck you in. <laughs> we were on Christmas vacation. I hate to even say we're on Christmas. What did we watch? The Blacklist. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. No, 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 no. It stole eight hours of my life in one day. Like I just sat there and kept letting it. I watched like 10 seasons of Blacklist and I went, I just lost a whole day. Like I did, so, so what I'm saying is, is you can get sucked in and not even realize how much time goes by and then your day's over and now it's bedtime. So, so li listen, I'm not saying don't watch TV. What I'm saying is, is be cognizant of how much time that steals for you. So challenge number one, challenge number one, everybody in here, find out how much TV, hours of TV you watch every week. That's seven days. That's not Monday through Friday. Yes, count veg out days. Yes, count out I'm off work. Yes, count I was up at three, couldn't sleep. Count it all and just tell yourself, I watch 33 hours of television? Do, let me just think about this. 33 hours. You, you could change your life in 33 hours. If, if, if you just cut it down to 23, that's an extra 10 hours to put into your marriage, into your kids, into your job, into your finances, into whatever you choose. Like, guess what? The time's yours. And if you're here and you say, well, I choose to watch TV. Okay, that's cool. But don't complain when your marriage is not solid. Don't complain when your kids are running them up. Don't complain when you get laid off because you weren't the star employee. Just know it's your time. If you want to live wisely, God says invest it wisely. Uh, the next one, number four, prune the activity branches of your life. How many of you have hobbies? 
Raise your hand if you have hobbies. So that would be, hobbies are things you don't need to do, but you choose to do, like uh, hunting and fishing. Okay, you can go to the grocery store. We don't have to live and kill your meat, okay? So listen, I hunt, I'm not digging on hunting, I'm just saying that's a hobby, takes a lot of time. Um, How many ladies in here shop? That's a hobby. You didn't need those pair of shoes, you decided to go hang out, okay? So Benet at epicchurch.tv, you can email her, it's true, it's a hobby, okay? So we all have these hobbies and things, and I would say this, how many of you in here work out? Because we're gonna talk about physical energy, which we'll talk about working out next week, so I just wanna go ahead and go on record of saying this, hello? Yeah, you got that quick, didn't you? He's like, oh. <laughs> Tell him, Pastor Ivy, say, hey, don't interrupt my service no more. Don't call, don't call him. Don't call him. We're busy. I'm just kidding. All right, so. ADD is for me. Okay, so. <laughs> there's probably some activities in your life that you need to stop. If, you hear and you, if you're here and you go to the gym and you go to the gym for, say, three hours, let me help you. One, you're doing one of two things. You walk around touching some weights and talking a whole lot, and your body hadn't changed in six months. You won't know why I just told you, because you're hanging out in the gym. You're not working out in the gym. Okay, so three hours is like, shave that down, do something. The other group is this. Your, your body hurts all the time because you're actually working out for three hours. You know what that's called? Overtraining. You're killing yourself. Listen, 45 minutes to an hour and 15. That's kind of the sweet spot. That's, that's all the time you need in the gym. You need, And you say, no, no, it's working. Look, I'm swole. Well, that's because you're pumping illegal drugs into your body, and you're killing yourself anyway. So stop doing that. This is work. I know this is really raw and just like it's out there, but the truth is God wants you to experience the most amazing life on the planet now, not when you get to heaven. And everything is profitable. I mean, everything is permissible, but not everything is profitable. Everything is good and balanced. So like if you're up in the gym for three or four hours, let me help you stop. Go work out about an hour, 45 minutes. Like actually do something and then go home. Cut your grass. Go home, spend time with your wife. Go home, throw football with your kids. I'm not saying don't go to the gym. I'm saying don't let it get out of hand because it's robbing something from you. Listen, go shopping, ladies. I don't go. Listen, you got a savings account, you want to blow it on chewing gum. Go to the dollar store, buy buy them out of chewing gum. Whatever it is your deal. But listen, if you're in here and you're, and you're married, how many married ladies in here? Let me help y'all. You don't need a girl's night out every weekend. You don't need a girl's night out every other weekend. You don't need a girl's night out once a month. And then they go, now I'm messing with you. And they go, well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, no. You married your best friend to spend time with them. The Bible says you became one flesh. Y'all left and cleaved together. Stop. Guys, you don't need a guy's night out. You used to be single. You got married because that sucked. <laughs> Stop trying to play like you're single. Hang out with your wife. If you got time to hang out with the guys, if you got time to hang out with the girls, guess what you got time to do? Go on a date. And your marriage will be stinking awesome because of it. It's your time. You gonna spend it wisely or unwisely? No, number five, practice simplicity. Expect the unexpected. Learn to say no. Turn off the TV. Prune the activity branches. Practice simplicity. How many of y'all in here ever been on vacation with your kids? Is that not awful? <laughs> Is this just like? <laughs> Okay, so, um, and, you know, that's just, that's just true. Um, how, many, how many of you took, like, your two-year-old to the beach and thought that'd be a good idea until you got them on the sand where they was like, eh, they wouldn't touch it, you know, and you had to scour them down with, um, what's that stuff called? Sunscreen. I don't use it, but so you, and, and, the, and like, when you, how many put the sunscreen on their face and they just started screaming? It burns. And you're going, it don't burn. We just we went to the beach, and me and they got to go by ourselves, and there was a couple, beautiful couple, sitting next to us. They had a baby and about a three-year-old son, and they had, they, they brought the city of Chicago with them. They had buildings everywhere. I'm talking about little tents, big tents, moving trucks, dump trucks, a little kiddie pool. I mean, they had it all, 
And they were down there trying to do, the, y'all, y'all, y'all been them or seen them. I mean, they, you know, 2.5 kids, white picket fence. We're going, we're going to the beach. Daddy is miserable. I mean, he, he's under there sweating, holding the baby, trying to keep it from screaming. Mama is <laughs> wiping salve all over this kid. She gets to his face and wipes. I'm, listen, she don't even do this. She just goes, she just wipes. <laughs> And he starts screaming, and me and Benet are sitting in our lawn chair, kid free. Ha <laughs> ha. Bet you wish you didn't bring him kid. So we're just sitting there watching it go down. And we ask ourselves, why did we ever do that? And listen, here's what he's screaming, it's burning. Mom snatches him up, says, it's not burning, takes him down to the salt water. Sets him in the salt water, splash it up on his face. Now he's, he's letting it rip now. He is going to town. <laughs> you know why we do that as parents? Because we have a dream in our minds that our kids don't have. Like we, we feel like if I take you to the beach, and I'm an awesome parent because all the other parents take kids to the beach, and everybody's miserable. Hot. How many of us hot at the beach? Do you know what hot and kids equal? Not fun. It's just not fun at all. And listen, if you're here and your kids love the beach, and bless you, go take them, and we're all jealous because it works out for you, but it never works out for us. And then one time, me and Benet scraped and saved, had some savings, had some money in our savings account, and spent money we didn't have to go on vacation. Whoever did that? Like, spent money you didn't have, so the whole vacation, you're stressed, where you're supposed to be having a good time, and I, you know, I got home equity line because I'm going on vacation. We decided to take our kids to Disney World. <laughs> okay, so... It's, you know what Disney World is? It's hot. We went in like June. You know why? Because the tickets were cheap. Yeah, I know why now. Nobody goes to Disney World. It's your feet melt on the concrete. And you go and you get these park hopper passes. Well, all that means you spend a ton of money and you're going to make your kids visit every single park and ride the ride and you're pushing them along. How many of you ever had this conversation with your kids? They get all sideways, ill on vacation. You go, let me tell you something, boy. We don't have a dadgum good time. Let's spend all this freaking money. You're going to smile. Smile for the picture. Get on the roller coaster. <laughs> How many of y'all just relived your vacation like, whoo? <laughs> Spent all that time at Disney World. Got home, set our kids down. How'd y'all like Disney World? <laughs> Joshua says, because he actually will speak his mind. Yeah, he's five years old. I didn't like it. <laughs> now, here's what I want to do. What? I spent money I didn't have. You don't come out. I didn't like That's what I, like y'all ever felt yourself get hot when your kid says something? You're like, so that was... But I heard from the Holy Ghost, name is Benet, touched, <laughs> touched my shoulder. I said, now, now baby. So I said, okay, okay, okay. Well, what would you rather do than go to Disney? <laughs> Can we just go camping? <laughs> you know what camping cost? Zero. A pack of hot dogs in a tent. That's what camping cock could have went in the backyard, spent all week long. Let me tell you, you know what they were telling us? They don't want our performance as parents. They want time with us. So if you're here, don't get wrapped up in the world to tell you, man, you got to spend 3000 2000 or whatever it is to take them to Panama City or Destin or Disney World or Hawaii or wherever it is that, that fits your tax bracket. Don't get wrapped up in that. Let me tell you what they really want, especially if they're a little bit smaller. They just want you to throw football. They just want you to play soccer. They want you to sit down to their piano with them. They actually, because they're into dance or gymnastics, they would love to see you turn a cartwheel, as jacked up as it is. Just, just hang out with them. You know what it cost you? Nothing. And they will remember that forever. Go camping. Go outside. Hang out with them. If your kid's into video games, sit down and play War of the World, whatever the flip they got going on. And let them destroy you because they're going to. Your hand-eye coordination is terrible. <laughs> just don't kick, the, don't kick the TV when you get beat. All right, practice simplicity. Number six, separate time from technology. Social media is unbelievable 
It is one of the greatest inventions that we've ever had, and it is, you can use it um, to do great things with, but it can steal you of time and you don't even know it. There are so many, and here's what's bad. There's so many parents who fuss at their kids for being on Snapchat and texting, but yeah, but you're surfing Facebook the entire time. There are so many women that want to engage in a conversation with their man, but he's afraid to talk to you because the Shekinah Facebook glory is shining upon your face so bright, he don't want to get close to you. If you'd set it down, y'all could actually begin to talk. Social media is a tool. It's not sent here to make you a tool. Step away from it just a little bit. If you don't see the next Facebook Live or the next post, your world will not end. You're going to be all right. If you have to, schedule times in to say, I will only look at Facebook at this time and this time. It, it'll set you free. I just don't, like if you just, if you just grade that one, forget TV. Grade your social media time. Probably, probably scare you to death. I'm like, oh my gosh, my eyeballs are going to fall out. Like, and I'm not, listen, this is not about don't watch TV. This is not about don't use social media. It's not about that. What it is is about being balanced and don't partner with the things to rob you of the thing you want, which is time. It's time with your spouse, with your children, at your job. If you was passed up for the promotion, don't gripe because you was probably in the break room on Facebook way too long. You were probably dialed in when you're supposed to be looking at some monitor. And they passed you up. And you don't, why? You're on Facebook. They see that. If you like social media that much, go get a job that entails social media. Like that's all you do for a living. Scroll, scroll, scroll. We have a guy here. His job is social media. You know what? He hates it. But I pay him. So, oh well. All right, so next one. Separate time from technology. Number seven, plan for free time. This is not about not having a schedule. This is not about being on like, you know, hippie dope smoking time, whatever. Hope it all works out. No, no, no. This is about having a schedule that doesn't have you. Run your schedule. Don't let your schedule run you. Grab a hold of the time that's been given to you. Manage it well. And if you don't plan free time, chances are in this, is, in this world, in this time frame, you're just not going to have any. You'll wake up and be three weeks into it and have never spent any time with your kids, your wife, your family, doing anything that you enjoy because the world will, will run you crazy. And God says, I need you to get back to kind of my deal on time. And number eight says this, get less done, but do the right things. Let me give you a formula. 20% of your effort produces 80% of your results. Now let's just take a kick from the Bible and pause right there. Think about that. That is a true formula for life. That's true in the business world. That's true everywhere. 20% of what you spend your time doing produces 80% of what you're enjoying. So here's, 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 what you need to un here's what you need to discover. What is that 20%? Do that and let the rest of the stuff go. People think in life, if I grind, there's a big, it's like it's right now, it's all over social media. Step into the grind. Grind all day. Grind all week. There's a really great motivational speaker, and I think he's awesome. He has great points, but he's like, on Monday I grind. On Tuesday I grind. On Wednesday I grind. On Thursday I grind. On Friday I grind. When you sleep, and here's his quote, I'll sleep and it's when I'm dead. Guys, that's asinine. That means you're moving yourself to a grave quick. 20% of what you do is producing 80% of what you enjoy. Find the 20% and do that. Let the rest of the stuff go away. Because you can work hard at your marriage, at your kids, at your life, or you can work efficient. I would just say, if the Bible says to live as wise and not as unwise, then I want to work efficiently. I don't want to waste the one thing I cannot create, which is time. You know that, right? You can't create time. You can only manage what you've been given. And the whole kicker of this thing is that God knew this from the beginning of... He writes this to us in Exodus. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Challenge, next challenge. How many of you, don't raise your hand, actually keep the Sabbath? You don't space it out. You don't hit it in increments. You don't take a half here, and a half, but actually keep the Sabbath, a day of rest, a day of unplugging from social media, watching TV, hanging out with family, eating good food, just chilling, resting in the presence of God, seeing what his creation is about. And let me just say this, the Sabbath is not on the end of the week, it's the first day of the week. And God says, if you give me this and keep it holy and rest, I will bless six days like you cannot imagine. We are tired we are stressed and we are overloaded because most of us don't do this one thing. We don't take a day, of a true day of rest. There's business owners in here and they cannot fathom. They are grinding seven days a week. Why is my business here? Because you're not honoring God with your business. I can't imagine why I'm not, why am I not at this place? I'm grinding because you're not doing the, one of the first things God said. Rest on the first day. And then I'm going to bless the next six. It would seem that in our day and age, the clock and the Christ are not friends. It would seem in our day and age that we as his people push God out of our time all the time. And until we're willing to get a handle on the hands of time that's been given to us, nothing will work like it's supposed to. This is for everybody in this room, myself included. Start with taking a day of rest. That God would bless the rest of them. It's a biblical principle. God says, whatever you give me first causes me to bless the rest. I don't have time to get up in the morning. No, no, no. You don't have time not to do it. you got to get up early in the morning. Give him your day. Give him a day of rest before the week starts. And yes, in a minute we're going to tithe. That means you bring God your first. And when you do that, he blesses the rest. It is a beautiful principle all through Scripture. And so many times guys like me focus on the money part. Here's what I want to tell you. I'm focusing on the time part. I'm focusing on the life part. Give him the first day of your week. It'll make the rest of your week amazing. Give him the first few minutes of your morning and the, in the, right, the start of your day. It'll make the rest of your day amazing. Give him your time so that you can have supernaturally, it would appear, more of time. I on purpose didn't ask the, uh, the worship team to come back up here and play keys at the end. Because sometimes when you play those keys at the end, some people cry and they don't know why. Right, we take ourselves back up to this super spiritual place when God says, no, I want you to keep your feet on the ground and put into practice what I've said because that's the difference maker. Practical obedience makes the practical difference. So we're not going to play keys because I don't want you to lose it up here. I want you to take those eight things and the challenges I gave to you and here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and apply those in Monday through Saturday life. Because the Bible also says if if. If you're going to hear the word, I need you to do it. Because if you hear the word and you don't do it, you're deceiving yourselves. And you know what? If you come here today and you hear this and you don't put it into practice, can I tell you what you've done? You've wasted your... Let's not do that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the most, one of the most practical messages that I've probably ever taught. It comes from Ephesians chapter 5 that charges us to live as wise and not as unwise. Let us recognize the shortness of our time on this earth that you have given us, blessed us with, but let us also understand it's robbed from us every day. And today we choose to make the most of that opportunity that's given to us. Let us take these eight things and implement them in our life to redeem back the time that the world wants to steal with us. Bless us, God. Father, as we begin to worship you in the next few moments by bringing you our tithe and offerings to this house, we just claim the promise that whatever we give you first, it causes you to bless the rest.
So God, as we begin by giving you our first day of the week and the morning of our day and the first part of our finances, we know and believe that that will cause you to show us favor and bless us in the most amazing way. In Jesus' name. And everybody said...